turn the mic on, turn it off, and, and this, and this, it means stop preaching, you know, that kind of stuff. So, welcome, welcome to Easter this morning. We are so glad that you're with us. Uh, in fact, it's pretty exciting to have all of you here. So this is the way we're going to open our service today. Uh, we're going to open it with the flower cross, and eventually as the music builds, we're going to start singing one of our first hymns. And if you've never been involved with the flower cross before, we basically are taking a symbol of death and we're making it 
new life. And by doing so, you're going to get some flowers. In fact, there are some being passed out. And if you don't have one, the ushers will be glad to give you one. And this up here, this uh, soft green stuff is like, uh, I used to call it frog, but it's aqua something. It's aqua mat. And it's, it's got all sorts of names. It doesn't really matter what it's called. You just push it in. Just take your flower and push it straight in. And we're going to transform this into the cross of resurrection and new life. So you get to be a part of that. Uh, we want to make sure everybody has a chance, young and old. And if you're taller, take the top. And if you're not, take the bottom. And if you can still bend over and get back up, you can take wherever you want. <laughs> so that's part of what we're going to do today. The other thing is that we have here these wonderful uh, palms. Uh, these are from our Palm Sunday service, and now they are crosses. And so you're welcome to take one of these uh, with you today. They're on the table here as you come by. So um, this is a chance for us to celebrate. I want to personally uh, welcome you here. I'm Pastor Jim Powell. I've been here almost two years, so we're still kind of figuring out how we belong as well. And uh, my wife Stephanie and I are so excited to have you here on this Easter. We had 38 people out there this morning for sunrise service and had a marvelous time there as well. Um, and uh, so we do uh, welcome you, and uh, we will be here for a while in worship, and then we're going to have a great fellowship afterwards. So, so grateful to be in partnership with everybody that leads this church and uh, in ministry. So grateful to be here. So, uh, Kevin, will you lead us into our opening hymn, and we will come forward as the Lord leads you. By the way, if you want to say hi to somebody when you stand up, it's a good time to greet your neighbor as you're coming forward.
could sing the second verse too. Let's do that. Again. Lives again. St. Matthews. Who are we? Like many questions, there's the long answer and there's a shorter one. This morning, we'll take the slightly shorter one. Uh, let me use a, a story to kind of illustrate uh, my experience here at St. Matthews. Uh, with this, this story, uh, Let's go back in time a little bit and imagine uh, a young family, mom, dad, son, daughter. The parents were believers, but there was something missing because they didn't have a church. They went sh church shopping. <laughs> Hard to say sometimes. Uh, the first one was a little too big and a little cold. The next one was a little small, and they wanted to sign you up for a committee. <laughs> and the next one was just right. They started attending here with uh, their children uh, in Sunday school. Over the years, the children grew into youth group and then went off to live their lives. Meanwhile, the parents got to know the other members, and found that they were warm and welcoming. Slowly at first they found a spiritual home that they were missing. They found a congregation where some were more conservative and others were more liberal. And others didn't know quite where their theology lay. But that didn't matter because they were non-judgmental and looked at this as a place to grow in their understanding of God. The thing that kept them together is the reason that we're here today, to celebrate the bottom line of Christianity, which is the resurrection. So, Christ lived and taught a message of love. 
he died a terrible death on a cross. And on that first Easter morning, he rose from the dead and promised everyone without exception that they could enjoy eternal life with him and with God if they would only believe in him. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. Our presence here today is a testament to our belief in the promise of Jesus Christ. The triumph of light over darkness. Just a short confession. Uh, this story started 40 years ago, and I'm still here. So if you want the longer version, find me after church. Thank you. Pastor Christy uh, Smith, who's a part of our church, uh, she's our children's ministry, family ministry person, and uh, she, she moves between three different congregations. She was with us this morning when we had our um, sunrise service, um, and she's also supplied a lot of uh, what we need today. We're not going to have Sunday school today because we'd like for the kids to stay here, but we do have an infant nursery that is available to anybody who would like to have that. So if you're just bored with the service, you're welcome to go up there. <laughs> Emma will play with you, I'm sure. Um, will you take adults today? And she, she says sure, so she's good with that. Um, but uh, we are grateful. Uh, so I've asked Christy to, uh, Pastor Christy, to give us a children's time that's uh, shared with all three of our congregations. Uh, she's over at Westlake for the 10 o'clock service, but we'll give a listen here. And then following that, if you do have any children that need special attention, uh, we are welcoming you to help, let us help you with that. Otherwise, we'll be here. And there are bags in the back with all kinds of good stuff in it and some activities. And after service today, we'll have an Easter egg hunt for those of you that are present. So we're, uh, and that again includes anybody who feels like a kid today. So, <laughs> Pastor Christy. Good morning, everybody, and happy Easter. I'm so excited that I have the opportunity to be with you guys either through technology or in your services. So friends, I wanted to share with you today about one of my favorite things about Easter. It's the light coming back into the world. At Advent, we talked about the light coming to the world. And this week we celebrated Jesus' triumphant entry. We celebrated the Last Supper, where in that Passover supper, he spoke about flipping the switch, and what is the bread of life? What is the cup of salvation? And then we went into a service of tenebrae, which is a service of darkness. But friends, fear not, there is light back in the world. <laughs> there is light. And no matter what we feel, or how we are, we can never extinguish the light of Jesus in this world or in our lives. Even if the strong winds blow against us, the light will <laughs> giving us a way to look past the darkness around us and into God's loving arms. So have a wonderful Easter, and I will see you soon. Let us pray. Oh, dear God, thank you being, for being our light and our salvation. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. All for the forgiveness of our sins, that we may live as holy Easter people. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, friends, go back to your pews, and your parents will be with you during this service. Or, if the teachers are in the back, go ahead towards the back. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Our scripture reading this morning is from Matthew 28, verses 1 through 10. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. 
His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers uh, Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There uh, they will see me. The word of God for the people of God. Resounding echoes of Hosanna reverberated in the streets of Jerusalem as faithful Jewish people gathered and prepared for the Passover festivities over the following days. The day for the Passover feast finally arrived. The disciples asked Jesus where he wanted them to go and prepare for their own observance of the Passover. He instructed them to go into the city where they would find a man carrying a jar of water. He would show them a large upper room furnished and ready. It was there that they were to make their preparation. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples gathered and shared the Passover meal. While they were eating, he took bread gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then Jesus took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me.
been condemned to a criminal's death on the cross, Jesus was led to a place called Golgotha. Two other men were placed on the crosses on either side of him. The soldiers, many in the crowd, even the criminals alongside of him, mocked and derided him. He saved others, but he can't save himself. Let him come down from the cross and we will believe in him. Let God rescue him. It was now about the sixth hour and darkness came over the land. The curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And then he breathed his last. In that moment, the words of the prophet Isaiah were fulfilled. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that made us whole and with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquities of us all. His divine messenger of love had died for us.
The earth stood silent as the savior of the world died in fulfillment of God's ultimate redemption plan. This humble man, who being the very nature God, has made himself nothing, taking on the role of a servant, being made in human likeness, he had humbled himself and become obedient to death, even death on a cross. A Roman centurion, who had been part of the execution of Jesus, was overwhelmed by what he had just witnessed. He said, truly, this was a righteous man. The very words of Jesus no doubt echoed in the hearts of many who stood at the foot of the cross and witnessed his death. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friend. The endless love of God, 
spans all eternity. It conquers hate, selfish ambitions, and senseless acts of injustice. The Romans and misguided religious leaders might have crucified the messenger that day, but they had not crushed the message, nor the boundless love of God. Love's redeeming work was not yet done. It was now, after the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. Suddenly, there was a violent earthquake. An angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat upon it. The guards were so afraid, they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Go quickly and tell his disciples. Christ is risen, as he said. Sing hallelujah. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. you've been listening to everything I've been whispering to my wife for the last half an hour, especially on Facebook. We know that some of you wanted to be here today, and I just want to send a shout out to those of you that uh, hurried home from hospitals and 
got up early and tried to get here, and I know that health has not allowed you to be here, so we want you to know as the church, we're praying for you on this Easter. We're keeping you in our thoughts and prayers. For those across the United States that's watching now and later on today, we also, again, celebrate with you a happy Easter. It's, it's hard to imagine, I guess sometimes, that Easter is a big deal. Um, although I heard in the news, because um, we always have news, right, that somehow Easter this year expecting to crest, uh, you know, sales, uh, that it's moving back. It's, it, Easter's on a comeback. Wow, how about that? At least in the retail market. <laughs> so chocolate, flowers, and bunnies, and peeps, and stuff like that, I guess, are starting to fly off the shelf, so they say. Well, it is not really a commercial holiday. It is the only holiday that we celebrate, other than Christmas, that truly is recognized by our country, but is based on the fact that someone was resurrected. Yet the history of Easter falls under a pagan holiday after a goddess named Esther. And uh, it was a fertility god who was goddess who was worshipped and all kinds of interesting things happened on that day about new birth and growth and fertility and all of these things that mm, the Christians kind of touched the, the universal idea of Jesus being born and then dying and then being crucified and then being resurrected underneath these holidays just for preservation but we don't need to tuck it under anything anymore. This truly has happened. And a lot of folks think, well, did it really happen? You know, you can argue a lot about things in the Bible, and you can certainly look at the resurrection as being questioned by some as, how could somebody fully come back to life, both body and spirit, and walk around and talk to more than 500 people? Just to borrow from this morning's message, let me just say, there's more historical evidence more literature and more witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ than ever was about even the birth or the life or the death of Caesar Augustus. We keep talking about things that are historically documented, like Alexander the Great, he died at 33 years old, is a common knowledge, yet there's only two documents that support that. There are literally thousands of historical documents, Roman, Jewish, Christian, even Muslim records that show that Jesus Christ was resurrected. Not that everybody wants to agree with how that happened or how he showed up, but it happened. It's a fact. It's something you can Google all day long and you'll get the same kind of story, although some of them twisted around. Was he really here? Was he really physical? No, things got real. And things got real in a hurry, and that's why all of our gospel lessons that deal with the resurrection deal with the real things that happen, like a violent earthquake. Yes, seismologists have gone back to figure out that in the year 33 AD was there a huge earthquake located someplace in the vicinity of Israel. The question has been answered over and over again, yes. Is the shroud of Torin that they wrapped the body of Jesus in really the one that's hanging in that that little village, which is now a giant, um, you know, tourist destination in Torin, Italy. Um, the answer is yes. It was carbon dated. It's been proven that that cloth came from the same years in which Jesus lived and died and was resurrected. We have plenty of facts, but ultimately, when it gets real, when life gets real, it gets down to whether or not you want to believe in that resurrection. Not that it happened, but that that has something to do with you and I. That's really where it takes kind of the rubber to the road, so to speak. And we understand what it means for things to get real. Well, let me give you some ancient history. So in 2020, hmm, that was only three years ago, there was this thing called COVID that moved across the country. And we thought it was someone else's thing until it became our thing. And on the 13th of March in 2020, not more than a little bit more than three years ago, I was sitting at a table um, in Pasadena and we were, we were appointing pastors to go wherever they needed to go in that year. And at the beginning of the day, there was news that somebody in Northern California had gotten sick with COVID, but we had not yet heard yet that he had died and that he was the first of many and that hospitals were filling up. In fact, we had planned a, uh, the church 
uh, the next steps of the church. It was an innovation seminar that was going to take place at a hotel in the LAX area. And what we dreaded the most that day was thinking about driving on a Friday afternoon from Pasadena to LAX. <laughs> Talk about a crucifixion, right? <laughs> So we, you, you understand that there are things we dread in life, but it became more real because every minute one of our phones, you know, we had a text message from another person who was canceling from that seminar. We had whole churches that were pulling out. Our bishop was saying, but we have to do this because the guest speaker and all of the arrangements are made and that person's flying in right now from across the pond. He came from England and he was going to be doing the teaching at this hotel at LAX. It has to happen. And, and we're uh, saying, you know, uh, well, here's another one. So, so far, 90% of our churches have pulled out of this seminar that we're going to have. Maybe they can turn the plane around. We weren't exactly sure what to do. But by the time two o'clock rolled around, an edict came from the state of California, the governor, and said, we're shutting things down. And by four o'clock that afternoon, grocery stores were barricading their doors because people were pushing through to try to get supplies. By five o'clock, all the toilet paper was gone. <laughs> you remember these days? Yes. Things got real, real fast. And here we were facing what seemed to be a death sentence for many. Truly, the news, if you go back and look at some of this, it's amazing the prognostications that were happening on that day. It's by no accident that by Sunday morning, three days later, there were many pastors in different churches of denominations throughout the country who were already preaching about the end times that the book of Revelation was now a reality. Things are getting real. Well, that's where you take theology and twist it into the circumstances, and I'm not advocating that at all, but I am saying that when things, quote, get real enough, then people start to pay attention to what's going on. And that's our story. That's our gospel story today. We're really talking about people who are realizing something's gone on. And I love the way Matthew puts this because he's, laying out for us how things get real. Things get real with earthquakes. Whoop. Oh, leave it there. All right. Earthquakes and flying around. People are going everywhere. Angels are descending. This angel is moving the stone away from the grave. And we don't quite know in the gospel if the women see this or not. I mean, it's a, it's a little uncertain, but it does say that he was sitting on top of the rock next to the tomb when Mary and the other Mary showed up. We're not sure who the other Mary is. Some commentators think that was actually Jesus's mother. So that was Mother Mary, who I think outranked Mary Magdalene. So I'm not sure how this worked in terms of the gospel writer, but it is important that Matthew, writing to the Jewish people, wanted them to know that this was something that was predicted in Scripture. In the Old Testament, in the laws, in the Pentateuch, there were indications of the Messiah coming back into the world in such a way. There's lightning and there's, there's, there's snow and there's, there's people who are so petrified of what's going on as things got so real for the guards that they were like comatose on the ground. There's running and there's falling and there's... Then, then Mary and Mary, who are looking for Jesus, are invited to come in and look into the tomb. Come see, you're looking for Jesus. He's resurrected. Come on here and take a look. And as they look in that tomb there, then immediately they run off and they're on their way back because the angel says, now that you've seen, don't stick around here. Go tell the disciples. Tell them that Jesus is going to meet them in Galilee. So now, all of a sudden, from he's dead, not only is alive, but we're going to ask all those disciples that ran for the hills and are hiding somewhere to come out and to make their way to where in Galilee? Not really sure. I guess there was a safe place for them. You remember when you used to go to Magic Mountain and you wanted to make sure your kids had a place to go if they got lost? Maybe not. Maybe you just let them go. I don't know. <laughs> I'm the only one that did that? Come on now, you know, meet at the fountain uh, right underneath the revolution. Oh, you people are terrible parents. 
Listen, when I had about 65 junior high kids, I wanted to lose half of them in the Magic Mountain, but we had to get them all home. So, uh, so Mary and Mary run, and as they're leaving, this is the part in Matthew that I just love because Mary and Mary are running down the path to go back to tell the disciples, Jesus has been resurrected, and get this, he's going to meet you in Galilee at that safe place that only good parents talk about, apparently. So, so this was to get them to know they're going to meet him somewhere, and that would be right before he ascends. An important thing that's going to happen. But what else is going on? As they're running down this path, Jesus shows up to them. They stand there physically in front of them. And he speaks to them. And the first thing he says is, do not be afraid. Oh yeah, the angel said that too. Petrified guys on the ground, women who were like, who stole our Lord? Now remember, Mary and Mary was going, were going there to unwrap the body of Jesus. This bloody mess. They were going to with their own hands, anoint every inch of his body in this oil, the burial rites and customs. Only a wife had the privilege of doing this, but there was no wife. I think that's why some of our commentators have leaned toward that would be the mother of Jesus who is going instead. And Mary Magdalene, the closest woman to Jesus, would be the one there to anoint him. They were going there to get real. These women were the only ones brave enough to show up, first of all. Second of all, they were going to go do this horrific thing for the person they loved. It got real, real fast. Now, the reality is Jesus is alive, and he is walking around, and he's in the world someplace, and as he does this, they fall down on the feet, they grasp his feet, they wrap around his ankles, Literally, with their faces in the dirt, things are getting very real. Now he's alive. Now you can touch him. And he's saying, wait a minute, I haven't quite ascended yet. I'm not, I got to go to the Father. Your Father, my Father, your God, my God. I need to, I still need, I got things to do. So keep going. Talk to the disciples. Let them know what's happening. You get the picture here. Everything has gotten down and dirty and real. Life-changing. These are the moments we need to remember that the resurrection wasn't something that happened. It's something that does happen every single day of your life. Every day we get up with challenges. We don't have enough of this. We're worried about that. We get into diagnostics next week on something that was done two weeks ago. We're finding out whether we have enough money to retire or even if that's a possibility. We're finding out how secure it feels in this world. Man, if you're looking for security off of the 11 o'clock news, forget that. I know most people don't even watch the 11 o'clock news anymore. They get it at 11 in the morning all the way through the day. So we're so inundated with what is going on in the world, which seems like real stuff. It, it's like our news is supposed to be the real stuff, but our faith and having some peace in our life is something that's not real. I would say it's the opposite. We're driven by such media, and we, we by the way, pay for it. So if you don't like it, stop paying for it. But the reverse is that the peace of God, which passes all understanding, that we can carry in our hearts and our minds and our souls every single day, that's what's real. The rest of this is all temporary. The rest of this is going to change over and over and over and over again. And we're about to enter an election year. Wow. Talk about what we don't want to hear and what we think we want to hear and what's going to be put our way. Where are we going to find peace in all of that? Things get real. Not when we run away from our lives, but when we run toward our lives. And that's the power of this cross. It's not just something to wear around our necks. It's actually the reality of living the resurrection every single day. So when things get real, well, there's fear. Sure, we get fear that either paralyzes us. Or it's the kind of fear that releases something in our bodies called adrenaline. And adrenaline is designed to give us what? Fight or 
Right, okay, you remember your basic science. Fight or flight. And yet today, what we're finding is most people use so much of their adrenaline in just trying to live every day that they have very little left. And that's why people panic. That's why people go into panic attacks, which is the second most common reason that 911 is dialed today. It's not heart attacks. It's not automobile accidents. The second highest reason people call is because they're having a panic attack. It feels like a heart attack and they want help immediately. So we call somebody, please come and help me. And a lot of research is now telling us that's because people have completely depleted all of their adrenaline just trying to live to the next day. On edge, anxious. COVID left us with this gift of being kind of in this state of grief that we've never quite gotten through. So everything seems more dramatic. I mean, when you see people fighting over stuff in a store, when you see uh, girls on the, on the playground in, in junior high who are pulling each other's hair out and kicking the other one to death, when you see kids that are flash mobbing in places, when you see people gather at this little beach at the end of the runway of LAX, you know this happened just yesterday. A thousand high school and young adults showed up at the beach. A thousand went to this party. And before it all ended, three were shot and in the hospital. And the rest were running through the town looting stores to get stuff out of the stores. At this beach that we, we used to think wasn't even a real beach. It was just, it's where all the jet fuel would drop every time a plane took off. Nobody in their right mind would go to this beach. Sorry for those of you that live there, but I just gotta say, we're, it's like we're losing our minds here. And I think it has everything to do with what's not real for us. So does fear paralyze us or does it drive us to a place where we actually find a little joy and a lot of trust? Because this is where Mary and Mary ended up. Not, wait, well, not faith with adrenaline. We don't need to pour that out. God has it covered. And that's the reality of the resurrection. Let me just close with this story. Trusting in the resurrection means in everyday life when things get to the point where you're not sure how it's going to turn out. You're really not sure how it's going to go. Uh, my brother, Bob, who attends here when I drag him and when Stephanie tells him to get out of bed, but when he comes to church once in a while, uh, he ended up uh, hiking with a group of friends into the Cascade Mountains uh, in the state of Washington. Uh, they were up in an area called Hurricane Ridge, which, by the way, is at the top of, of a 200-plus rainfall rainforest that is in the uh, mountains up there, the Olympic Mountains. And uh, he and his friends hiked off into there. They, there was about 12 of them, college friends. They're very experienced hikers. They had tents. They had emergency equipment. They had emergency rations. They had, they had what they needed, but what they didn't expect was a storm to come in so early in the year. And as they got further up into the mountains, they all of a sudden were caught in a blizzard, and they were in a total whiteout, and 12 of them split somewhere along the way, and my brother and one of his friends went to the right, and the rest went to the left, and they made it, after two days, they made it down out the other side where emergency crews were ready to greet them because they were, they were a lost party of 12. My brother and his friend were the two that got lost up there. So they bivouacked. They went into, uh, built a snow cave, and they, they basically went underground, and they were there for those 48 hours. And my dad... Um, you know, was waiting. He, he had the car and he was at the other part of the trailhead waiting for them to come off. They never did. And another day went by and another day went by. So my dad went and found a, a helicopter charter because the authorities thought that they were already dead or it wasn't worth going back up because they couldn't fly in this weather. Well, that wasn't going to keep my dad a World War II veteran down. So he rented his own helicopter. And, and he found a charter pilot, didn't care what kind of weather it was, as long as there's money. And so up they went, and they, they did a pass or two. And finally, 
um, uh, there was news that they had dug themselves out. But I remember in that moment hearing from my dad when we asked about how Bob was, he said, we don't even know where he is. You know. He was living in that. <clears throat> I, I know there's a God. But I'm not necessarily one who believes that God is going to perform some kind of miracle right now. The truth is, my brother and his friend could have died up there. It's, it's absolutely true. But trusting in the resurrection doesn't mean that someone doesn't die. It means that death is not the end. And we always have hope that there will be hope into the future. Now, obviously, Bob still comes to church here. And he didn't die. And that's not a ghost. This is a real person. But... It took a miracle because with no food, they were able to find their way out with no bearing, and the landscape was all snow, and the trails were gone, and they made their way, and after I think it was three and a half, four days, they finally came down the trail. I think the difference between the way I approached it and the way my dad was, I knew that God had a presence in my brother, and I knew that my brother was going to be okay no matter what the physical results were of this day, but he wasn't quite too sure about that. And nobody wants to lose their child. And certainly no one wants to go before their child. Friends, I don't know where you come from in all this, and I, I understand that we often want to give religious talk to this idea of resurrection, but it is the reality of living every single day, trusting that God is present. And trusting that we can trust that God is not going to leave us or abandon us. Amen. And amen. Light overcomes darkness. It certainly does. As we move to this time of prayer today, we want Jack's going to lead us through a time of praying for each other with each other. And there are prayer cards that you should have gotten inside your bulletin as well. And if you don't feel that you can pray um, out loud today or fill in a name when it's offered, uh, we're inviting you to write that prayer down and pass it around uh, or put it in the plate when that plate comes by. And if you are a guest with us, a visitor, a guest with us today, you do not have to contribute to our church. If you wish to, we'll use that money for ministry, but don't feel obligated. So as Pastor was explaining, uh, we have a chance to pray with each other and pray for each other. And so some of you may have found a piece of paper like this or a card like this and uh, made it available to the ushers to bring to me. So I have a couple of those. And if you want and you have one of these, you can fill it out, put it in the plate, as Pastor said. And We'll pray for uh, that person, that situation, after service today. But as I pray, I'm, I'm going to kind of pray in, in sections. And so let's take, for example, cancer. Cancer is a, a, a huge problem in our health care, uh, in our nation, in our world. And so if you are experiencing uh, that condition or you have a loved one that is a friend I'm going to pause after I mention cancer and, and you can just say that name we want those names to be heard we want them to be part of, of our thanksgiving and our needs so let us pray. Eternal and loving God, we praise your name and give you our highest praise that we have the freedom and the opportunity to worship you here this morning. We give you our eternal thanksgiving for the miracle of Easter when Jesus was raised from the dead on that first Easter morning. Help us to never forget what you have done for us. We give you our thanks and praise for both large and small blessings that we have received and that we are receiving 
each and every moment. Great thanks for those who have been healed from illness and injury. And we give our thanksgiving this morning for our friend Jim, who was released from the hospital just yesterday. For reconciliation of families and strengthening of relationships, accept our thanks. Be with all who mourn today. May they have the Holy Spirit within them to comfort the pain of their loss. For all of those who are hospitalized and those confined to beds with sickness and injury, may they receive healing and reassurance. We lift up 12-year-old Matilda for comfort and healing for her and strength for her parents. We pray for Ralph, who's hospitalized with dementia. Lord, cancer is a major health problem for many. Give the doctors new treatments to bring the remission that they see. Strengthen their faith in carrying through this journey. Lord, this day we recognize that you sent your Son to heal our relationship with you. We pray for those with relationship issues that they can discover the path that leads to reconciliation. Our community suffers with those who are homeless and others afflicted with poor, poor decision-making. Hear our prayers for righteous interventions to point the way to a more successful life. Be with our nation as we struggle with violence, incivility, as well as natural and man-made disasters. You sent your son to save a troubled world, and we have not heard your direction. We pray for those who are refugees, that they may find shelter, that leaders of warring countries can find the way to peace. There are manifold issues that plague our lives and those of our families and our friends. Help us to reach out to them in love. We pray for ourselves that our hearts and our minds are open to your Easter message of love. Help each of us as we go forth today to reflect the love that we have received to others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And now let us join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, 
and the glory forever. Amen. With the understanding that God has given us so much, let us contemplate how we can return a bit of what we have received in time, in talents, in prayers, and in treasures. give you thanks for all that we have received. And we just ask that you accept these are gifts and tithes, a small token of what we have already received. And we ask that you help us to use these gifts, these tithes, to bless others to hear the message of Easter. And we say, Amen and Hallelujah. All right, so yeah, let's stand. Oh, we're already standing. <laughs> so let's use our voices to uh, give praise and glory to the Most High, our, our Creator, our Redeemer, our Savior. Uh, crown Him with many crowns.
God go with us, not just in theory, but truly the Lord of our life and in our hearts. May we find the peace and joy that you wish for us so that we may enter the world as the ones who give peace, not create chaos. We are praying this for us, for our families, for all who we serve. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you wouldn't mind being seated for just a minute, we've got a couple things we want to tell you, and we promise we'll let you out of here. Uh, because there's apple pie on the patio, so I know. I've asked them to save a piece for me, just in case. But anyway, we have an Easter egg that may have already happened. I don't know. It looks like they've been hid. I can see a few from where I'm standing. So I know the kids are going to come out and do that right away. Um, and then next week is Holy Humor Sunday. This is your chance to send me whatever you'd like, um, as long as it's appropriate. Uh, please send me a joke or uh, some story, humorous story, or some anecdote that you think would be helpful. Uh, you can do that by sending it to uh, my email or the church's email, but uh, I'm at Pastor Jim 2 spell it all out, uh, at gmail.com. Uh, did I say Jim Powell too? Pastor Jim Powell too. It anyway, it's on the it's on some information in the back there, and uh, if it's not appropriate, don't bother sending it. So here you go. On May seventh, we're going to bless the animals, your animals, any animals, horses. Yes, we can handle, but they can't come into the church. Okay, so uh, we're going to do that right out here on the corner on May seventh. So we invite you to come by with your animal, whatever it is. Um, and uh, even boa constrictors. I used to own one of those, so it doesn't bother me a bit. That's going to happen before church, and then uh, go back one, if you would. Yeah, we do have a talent show coming up, too, um, and that's going to be, if you're interested, and you've got a talent you want to share, uh, we can give you information on how to sign up for that as well. And then here are all the things happening with Caneo Connect for a long time to come. We got vacation Bible school. All this information, I think we put in a bulletin here. But uh, we just want you to know a lot's going on, and we'd love for you to be a part of it. Meetings? No, no meetings. We're done with meetings. No, actually, those happen later on. And then these are all about our lilies that we have. Um, aren't they beautiful? And especially the colored ones back here. So we're grateful for that, and we're grateful for you. So thanks for sticking around with us. I hope you enjoy the fellowship, and happy Easter, everybody. Welcome home. All right, let's go. <laughs>